uh, that's uh, Samantha. So uh, thanks to Samantha, she's our technical person behind the scene. Um, my name is Ann Friedman. I am the chapter chair of the retiree chapter. Uh, thanks to Samantha and to Diane, the vice chair, and Bonnie, our secretary, who will be helping out to move this meeting along today. So just a very few things about our chapter um, that some people know and some may not. We are a full-fledged chapter of the PSC. We have close to 3,000 members. We have our own executive council of 27. We have two representatives on the union-wide executive council. We have seven delegates and five alternates to the delegate assembly of the entire union. We have delegates to NYSIT and AFT, and we vote in, in union elections, university-wide officers, and we vote for our own officers. So we are a very um, strong uh, and active and connected chapter. We have our own web page, and I think Bonnie is going to share that screen right now. The easiest way to stay up to date is to check our website, our website within the PSC website. And there's an address you can uh, write PSC CUNY dot org slash retirees and that will take you directly to our web page and when if you look at the red uh letter the red phrases at the top, along the top banner you can click on any of those and go right to whatever you want and so if you want to become a member Click there, it'll take you to the form. If you want to know what's happening day to day with the healthcare crisis, and I mean day to day because Bill Freetime updates this with any new changes, you can go to the healthcare update. Uh, uh, so you can use our um, website for many things and to keep up. And that is the most important way that we we communicate with you uh, most quickly and most up to date. We also have our own monthly newsletter, turning the page, and uh, you can get to our newsletter on. There's a link. Okay, we have chapter committees like a program committee, newsletter committee, anti-racism committee. Our members are very active in cross uh, PSC committees such as the social safety net, the environmental justice and the legislation committees. Now, our most important work over the last year and a half as you know, has been our struggle to retain our health care plan as we know it. And that continues right now. Our strength is in you, our numbers, and we want to keep you up to date. So if you have not been getting recent email messages like a letter from James explaining um, the latest update on the health care. Please let membership department know. 212-354-1252 or email membership at psemail.org. Get your colleagues to join. 
renewal notices. I know there's been a delay. Uh, I don't know if you've received them yet, but you will receive them. And and uh, there's been a little, there's been some transition at the union. So finally, and some of you have done this, if you have a question, maybe you wanna write something for the newsletter, maybe you have an idea for a book group, maybe you have an idea for a movie group, maybe you have uh, an idea for a program, write to us and it's very easy. Retirees at pscmail.org, retirees at pscmail.org and we will get back to you. We've been trying to do that every day, a few times a day so we can communicate. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to the very special part of our program. Uh, as unionists, we know how important it is for, understand, for us to understand the labor context in which we work. And that's uh, where we are situated in the city, in the state, and in the nation. And we have today an expert for, who many of you may know or have, heard, or have heard of, Ruth Milkman, Distinguished Professor, CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, is well known for her extensive writing on work and organized labor in the United States, past and present. Professor Milkman will present an analysis of recent uni unionization trends in New York and the nation, including a discussion of the uptick in organizing in the past year. Ruth, we welcome you to our meeting and look forward to your talk. Thank you, Anne. It's really nice to see a bunch of um, old friends as well as some other folks who I don't know. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint to make this easier for everyone. So let's see if I can get that to work. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so as you may already know, because I've done this for this group a few times now in the in past years, every Labor Day at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, we put out a report like this. Um, the I've been doing it for a dozen years or so. The My co-authors have shifted over the years, and this time it's a graduate student called Joseph Vandernald who gets a lot of credit for some of what you're about to hear. Um, he really worked hard on it. And um, anyway, so what we try to do is give a kind of overview of trends in unionization in the city, the state, and the country, as well as every year we have a sort of special feature on some topic. And this time, for kind of obvious reasons, it was a no-brainer to focus on the new wave of organizing that I'm sure you're all reading about in the news. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of both in the brief time I have. Um, So let's see if I can get this to move. So far, it isn't moving. Here we go. Okay. So um, what I just said sort of corresponds to the good news and bad news aspects of the report as a whole, because the long-term trends, unfortunately, are just like they've been for quite some time, kind of grim story of continuing relentless decline in union density um, everywhere, including here in New York. Um, the other part is more um, inspiring perhaps. And as you'll see, New York in particular um, has a kind of leading role in some of the new organizing, which frankly, we did not expect to find when we first started looking at the data. Um, so again, I'll, I've already said this, I'll do a kind of update on the overall trends and then spotlight the new um, developments that you've all become aware of, I'm sure in the last year or so. So the bad news, like I said, the, especially in the private sector, the long-term decline continues basically everywhere. And so the takeaway here is simply that the new organizing that we're also inundated with news of, exciting as it is, has not been sufficient for reasons you'll, you'll see in a minute to move the needle on this bigger picture. The United States has a labor force of about 160 million workers. 
So you got to organize an awful lot of people to make a dent in this situation. And that has yet to happen. Maybe it will, but we're not there now. Um, so just in case it's not obvious, the, um, the other thing you can see on this graph is that um, there is the long-term decline. And of course, if I showed you earlier years than the last 20, it's even grimmer. I mean, there's a very precipitous decline in the 1980s, for example. But the other thing that's striking is that um, in New York, we have roughly double the union density of the United States. And that's true of both the state and the city and has been for some time, as you can see. So, um, I mean, two times zero is zero as the mathematicians in this group could tell us, but and two times six is only 12. It's still a very small part of the workforce, but you know, that's something. Um, okay, and in the public sector, um, unionization is much higher overall, but we've also, for reasons I don't fully understand, we have seen a dip in the last, since we last did this report um, in the public sector. It may simply be, you know, the, um, there's a lot of moving parts here. So one, what affects density is both has a numerator and a denominator, how many union members are there, but also how many employees are there. And of course, um, in the in the in the city in the last in the pandemic period, we've lost a lot of people who were employed in public education, for example, a huge chunk of union membership. Um, and so they would not show up in either the denominator or the numerator. That may be a big chunk of it here, but I don't fully understand why. Um, anyway, probably, well, with any luck, that will bounce back, as you can see it kind of jigs and jags anyway over the years. Um, so now this is the same thing in a different form. Um, here we have a little bit more geography. You can see this country, the state, the five boroughs, upstate separately, and then the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, one more important thing that I should mention. Um, so these graphs and the report as a whole, which I ha will have the link for you at the end if you want to read all the gory details, um, it's based on current population survey data, which is a monthly survey that the US government does. And it's actually the only systematic data that exists in the United States on union density for the whole country. They ask people if they say they're working, they ask that if they're in the labor force, they're asked, are you a member of a labor union? If they say no to that, they're asked if they're covered by a union contract. Um, of course, not all respondents know the answers to those questions. So the data are far from perfect, but anyway, that's how they do it. and. Um, and then, of course, they ask lots of other questions about what industry you work in, what occupation, et cetera. Um, but this, when I tell you about New York City or New York State, this is based on not where people work, which the CPS does not collect data on where they on where they work. It just is based on where they live. So someone who works in Manhattan but lives in New Jersey is counted as a New York City person. Um, I'm sorry, I got that backwards, is not as counted as a New Jersey person, right? And there are people who live in the city and commute to other non-New York City workplaces, for, um, but there's many more in the other direction. So that kind of messes this up a little bit. But again, that's it's kind of the only data out there. Um, in the report, we do include the numbers which are significantly higher um, claimed by um, <laughs> New York City unions, based on these government reports that they have to file every year called LM2s, that's under the, anyway. Um, and those numbers are a little different. Those reflect though, I, I think some of them are a little inflated anyway, but apart from that, they reflect where the jobs are. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're drilling down on any of this. Um, so now I just wanna say a little bit about the recent organizing. Um, we've all been reading about it, I think partly because there are these kind of, very high profile companies involved like Amazon and Starbucks and now Apple and Trader Joe's and less high profile, but maybe of interest to some of you, REI and here in Manhattan. Um, again, I did not expect to see this, but it turns out even if you don't count Amazon, New York City is kind of leading this new wave of organizing. These are numbers um, based on um, NLRB data. This is, um, only private sector, obviously. And um, we broke out Amazon separately because technically it shouldn't really be counted yet because the union has not been recognized. You know, Amazon has filed all these unfair labor practices and that's gonna go on forever. So 
Um, anyway, but you can see that even without Amazon, um, New York City has a slight lead over Seattle and the two of them are well ahead of these other places. And this is um, per capita, that is as a per, not quite per capita, as a percentage of the labor force. So we are taking the large size of New York into account here and it's still um, number one for whatever reason. Um, again, I did not expect this, but anyway, this is a phenomenon that's mostly limited to blue cities. Um, there are exceptions. Some of the Starbucks especially are in very different kinds of locations that you probably know, but that's the overall picture. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, I thought it was interesting. Now here is a different cut um, of the same information, but well, not quite the same information. This one includes um, voluntary recognitions. You know, believe it or not, sometimes employers faced with a union drive don't fight it, but say, okay, we'll recognize you. Sometimes that's not a happy story. Sometimes they do that because they want to recognize a kind of sweetheart union who, in, if they're threatened by organizing from a more militant one, they might do that. So sometimes that's what it is. But in any case, um, those are also new unionization uh, accomplishments in, in some sense. Um, so, and what this graph shows you is the um, success rate for NLRB elections. So of course, sometimes unions lose those elections. Quite often they do actually, historically. Um, but as you can see, the success rate is pretty high. Um, if you count both the voluntary recognitions and um, the successful elections, New York retains its number one position for the cheerleaders in the group. But um, actually, Seattle and Boston both have higher rates of success in elections per se. But anyway, it's basically the same story. These are the places where the action is um, for whatever reasons. I mean, we know the reasons. Um, and the other thing to notice about this, though, is that um, there's a lot of other campaigns going on, organizing campaigns that have been happening all along that are not in the news because they aren't, the companies are not these iconic brand names that everybody cares about. So as you can see here, um, this is showing the number of new union members by the organized by the union that they are affiliated with. So for example, the UAW, which as you know, represents a lot of um, graduate student workers, adjuncts, museum workers, and so on. They organized in New York City. And um, now I don't show you the US here, but look how much bigger their number is than Starbucks say, which, you know, has some, but the, the Starbucks thing is um, interesting in that there's a lot of shops. I believe they're up to 225 now where they've had successful elections, but each of them employs very few people. So it doesn't, you know, again, it doesn't move the needle. But, you know, this is important to keep in mind that you're not hearing, you're only hearing about those cases, not the stuff that's, that happens all the time. Um, and now this one is just showing a kind of historical perspective, not very far back, but the last 20 years. And if you look at that, you can see that the um, recent uptick, I like to call it an uptick as opposed to say a surge or something, um, because it, I don't think it qualifies as a surge yet, as this graph makes obvious. Um, it is higher than, there's a dip during the pandemic, makes sense. And um, now it, there's this pretty extensive uptick um, in the last year or so. But um, if you look back to, you know, as recently as 2015, there was more um, going on in terms of um, organizing and you don't have to go back too far to find just as many successes. So in, his, in this sort of short historical perspective, um, you know, we should just keep that in mind. So the 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 real issue is that so many um, of, there's so much media interest in all this, and that really amplifies it. And I'm not saying it's not important. I think it is important and interesting. And it's also a very different um, demographic in terms of who's doing this organizing than we usually see. And I will say a little bit about that. Um, I, that's not numbers, so I'm going to stop the PowerPoint now, but if you could see the link here, if you're interested in all, there's much more detail in the actual report. Um, but let me just say that what's driving this, in my view, is a phenomenon that we haven't, well, we've seen it a little bit in the last few years, but in the long-term historical perspective, it's not the usual suspects. Leading the charge in these campaigns are mostly young college educated 
workers who are underemployed in some way. So they, you know, went to college, maybe accumulated a bunch of debt, thought this was a ticket to some great job, and now they work at Starbucks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and this is not entirely, it's not just in the last year. Like, I think we've been seeing this for a while, for example, in, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm sure you've got the um, website by now if you want it. Um, we've, we've seen this for a while. For example, in higher education, adjuncts and graduate student workers are in some ways the extreme case of that, right? The adjuncts are paid next to nothing, as I don't have to tell you. And um, they have a, often a PhD or some other advanced degree. So the gap between their sort of expectation and um, what they're faced with in the labor market is, is huge. So that's kind of an extreme version, but we've also been seeing this for a while among journalists. The um, News Guild, for example, is doing a ton of organizing, has done for several years now among journalists who also fit this profile. They're usually quite highly educated, quite young, very underpaid and precarious in all kinds of ways. Um, and it's not quite as true at Amazon. Um, the leaders there do seem to fit this profile to some degree, but not so much the members who are more traditional working class. And it's, I might add, it's a more traditional workplace in that regard, too. It's basically like a factory, except with a lot of surveillance. Um, so anyway, I think I should probably stop there and see if there are comments and questions. I'm happy to talk more about this, but I wanted to leave time for discussion. I hope that's okay if that's permitted by the yeah, webinar that, format. That is definitely permitted. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth. And I'm I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, we're going to try to ask you to keep those questions and comments to one and a half minutes so that we can uh, get as many people as we uh, and as many people who want to, to ask a question. So in order to ask a question, do we remember how to do that? We go to reactions on the bottom, of, no, no, yes, we go to reactions on the bottom of your screen and at the bottom of the pop-up, you will see something that says raise hand. And if you could raise your hand that way, um, and when you're ready to speak, Samantha will unmute you. So uh, I think we can start that now. Uh, my hand is up, but I am not gonna ask a question right now. I am going to uh, see what others are, are interested in, in asking. I see Mike Frank. Uh, can we unmute Mike Frank, please? Samantha's going to unmute you. Got it. I'm, I think I am unmuted. Yes. Okay. Um, Ruth, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, most of us, I think, are um, have some sense, at least, of the long-term trends, although not in the detail you, you presented it, which is useful. Um, my question is, how do you account, how do you explain the long-term decline in human density, starting, say, wh whenever? the 70s and the 1980s, how do you account for that? I think that's where um, we would perhaps have some debate and discussion. So we'd like to have your view on that. Sure, um, I mean, it's complicated obviously, but the biggest single factor in my view, and it really takes off in the 1980s, so there's some erosion before that, is um, an employer offensive against unions as part of the what many people call the neoliberal era transition, you know? Um, so that's not the only factor. So for example, the emergence of new sectors that no one really tried seriously to organize, you know, that chips away as well. And that starts much earlier. Um, Deindustrialization has its role here because the manufacturing was so highly organized. So when that, when all those factories close or move abroad or whatever, that has an impact. So it's not the only thing, but I think there's kind of a consensus now among scholars that employer aggression toward unions and the rise of the whole union busting industry and all that is the key change. And, you know, they've been quite successful at it. So that's the other thing about these recent campaigns, when you read about Amazon fighting back or Starbucks, you know, 
this is nothing new. They, private sector employers have been doing this for a long, long time. It's routine. They um, are allergic to the idea of unionism in most cases. And if they're faced with a union drive, the first thing they do is call Luther Mendelssohn or another you know, anti-union law firm to help them fight back. And often they prevail, not always. So what's more unusual here is that they're not winning all those efforts as we've seen. So that's just a very brief answer to a very complicated question. Thanks. Okay, Joan Greenbaum, please. Uh, I think Hi, I'm Joan. On. Nice to see you. Hey, Ruth. Hey, everyone. Great, great turnout. Fabulous. Um, yeah, I guess it's a follow up on Mike's question, and that is the newer organizing that's happening bottom up. Uh, certainly Amazon, Starbucks, and as you pointed out, Starbucks, not that many workers, appears not to be from the central unions, but from the workers themselves. A am I overstating this? Um, that's sort of true. It's definitely true at Amazon, like they, um, at, in Staten Island, that that is an independent union that um, defied all expectations and succeeded in organizing there without any resources to speak of or any affiliation with an established labor organization. I mean, they actually did get a little help in small ways here and there, but basically they did it on their own in just the way you're describing. Starbucks is a little more complicated. You know, that's Workers United is the union, which is actually an SEIU affiliate. And it's um, the main person, as I understand it, sort of in Workers United, who's working on this is Richard Benzinger, a name some of you may know. He was the leader of the Organizing Institute back in the John Sweeney era at the AFL-CIO and has a long, um, very illustrious record as an organizer. So that's a little different. I think they have tried to empower the workers themselves, many of whom are extraordinarily capable to kind of run their own show, but they do have help from an established union. So it's not quite the same. Um, and most of the others, like the Trader Joe's and Apple, those are not often, are, are usually, a, you know, it's the communication workers have done some of the Apple ones, for example, or so yes and no, I guess is the answer I would give to your great question. Um, yeah. Okay, Erwin um, Yellowitz. Thank you, uh, Ruth, for that presentation and for the work you do every year in presenting these numbers. Uh, I'd like to uh, just point out historically that uh, union density today is less than it was in uh, 1900 when the union movement was about 10% of the labor force. So we have really declined, but uh, the up and downs have been very stark. So for instance, uh, the gains that unions made have been in very limited periods. Uh, the 1930s, of course, with the founding of the CIO and with the um, activation of the AFL unions, uh, the post-war period when unions were very strong and recruited large numbers of members and um, employers accepted uh, unions. So those are the two major periods. And I'm wondering if you see any major event that might uh, change the picture that you have presented uh, about the decline, which began in the 1970s and accelerated in the 1980s. Is there anything out there that's akin to the Great Depression of the 30s or akin to the post Second World War uh, conditions that might revive the labor movement? Um, what a great question and comment. Thanks for the historical perspective. You're absolutely right. There's one more blip that you didn't mention that I'll just since we're in the public sector at PSC, I'll mention too, which is a big surge of public sector unionization in the 60s and 70s is another one. And the point, I think maybe this is what underlay your comment just now, unionism does not grow in dribs and drabs incrementally. It, when it does grow significantly, it happens in these giant upsurges. And, you know, for reading the newspaper, you might have the impression that that's what's underway at the moment. But as I tried to show you, the numbers don't bear that out. Um, and, well, let's let's think about why that might be um, and what could change it. You know, it's possible this is the beginning of something like that. 
it's, I wouldn't want to, I'm terrible at predicting the future. I've learned that the hard way. So I wouldn't want to rule that out. I don't see it myself, but I hope I'm wrong. Um, what was different about the 30s, of course, and now we're back to such low density, it's as if it never happened, was there was also partly as a result of labor militancy, new legislation that really made it easier to organize in the um, late 1930s and, and onward. So, you know, that's not gonna happen with this Congress and especially the Senate that we have now, but that could make a difference. There is actually legislation that's been lingering for years in Washington. The, so the latest version is called the PRO Act, Protect the Right to Organizing. That would, you know, it would make some difference if that became law, but it's not gonna happen unless, you know, there's some great drama that we aren't seeing now in November or something. So, you know, that's sort of part of it. But here's the parallel to the depression maybe that is more relevant. I don't know, this is not gonna by itself lead to any kind of upsurge, but what I was saying before about the young people who are the highly educated young people who are driving this, in some ways it is driven by the revival in that, in that generation and especially the educated component of it, of an interest in labor, but also an interest in a critique of capitalism which I don't think this country has seen on such a large scale since the 30s. So that part is similar. Um, now, whether that enables a, a really, and they're really into labor too. That's late unions are cool again, as I like to say, you know, for, the, for those folks. And so that's important, um, but there's a lot of structural obstacles to sort of turning that into the kind of dramatic increase that, that Erwin was describing, you know, in the past. Okay, uh, Doris Hart. Yes, hi, thank you for your presentation and all that, this good information. Now, I was wondering how much of the uptick is due to a really outspoken pro-union president who comes on the air and tells people that unions are good. Does that have much effect on the organizing that's going on now? Well, you know, there's no way to really measure that. It, it is true that he says all the right things, doesn't change the legal situation, of course, but it's, I, I'm sure it's a morale booster for some. I suspect that might've been more important in um, the strikes that we saw last fall. Remember they used to talk about Striketober in October, 2021. There were these giant strikes at John Deere, Kellogg's and a few other places. Those were long organized, um, unions that were at the end of their collective bargaining agreements, the end of their contracts. And as you know, during the life of a contract, it's illegal to strike in most, in almost all cases, although that doesn't mean it never happens um, in the private sector. But um, at the end of a contract, you're free to do it. There have been very few strikes, another sign of the kind of crushing of unions by employers, partly because in the private sector, it is completely legal for employers to hire so-called replacement workers during a strike, and they are under no obligation to rehire the strikers once the strike is settled. So to put it mildly, that has put a huge damper on strikes. But in 2021, with the pandemic-induced labor shortage, where were the John Deere going to find 10,000 replacement workers? I was hopeless. And so you know, those were long unionized workers who then were emboldened. And by the way, that did come a lot from the rank and file in those places because I think the union leadership is so used to being beaten up that they, they're sort of paralyzed almost by um, all of that and, and don't always have the, don't always see these opportunities coming, but it happened and they did go along with it in the end. So, you know, there's that kind of dynamic and I suspect Biden is more um, relevant to those folks than he is to the Starbucks workers say, but I don't really know, maybe, I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt to have him saying all these nice things about unions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Marsha, Marsha Newfield. Hi, um, I had a couple of things. One is um, uh, just to note that the AFT at its recent convention mentioned that it had given $225,000 to Starbucks organizers. So that's something, I mean, they're a union, mm -hmm. they're a union and I wondered, what could other unions do, like our union? What can an ordinary, not vast union do to push either the um, the PRO Act or to raise the consciousness, you know, of workers? 
Well, what a great question. I mean, I think many of you are already doing a lot of those things. Um, in terms of money, I'm not sure that's what the Starbucks people need, but they do need expertise. They're getting it from Benzinger. Amazon really needs it. Um, and just experience and legal capacity and all the rest of it, because, you know, these employers have all of that, right? Um, so that's one thing. Now, the, they haven't really mostly reached out much. Sorry, let me say that again. These new organiza organizations haven't reached out much to the wider public for support. Actually, Starbucks has. There is, I signed up for this. There's some, you know, support Starbucks when they need you kind of web website that you can sign up for. I have not heard from them except once when I happened to be out of town when they were inviting people to go to some rally in Queens. I, I wasn't able to go, but so, but that may change. I mean, there is a possibility since, so look, the other thing that I didn't mention, but maybe it's obvious to this group, I think Amazon will get, the Amazon Labor Union, for example, will get union recognition eventually. And some of the others already have official recognition from the NLRB. It's a very pro-labor NLRB. This is partly a reflection of Biden. Maybe more important than his rhetoric is that he's appointed this amazing woman, Jennifer Abruzzo, as the head of the NLRB, who, you know, things are, are going to, that helps in terms of, you know, ruling on all these unfair labor practice charges and all the rest of it. But then that's still just the beginning then they first have to negotiate their first contract. And we know that in recent years, about half of all NLRB successful elections never yield a, a first contract. So that's where you might really need public support. And I can imagine, I've heard some of them talk about it. You can imagine there might be strikes at that point, for example, at Starbucks, things like that. And that's where the public really could make a difference. And these companies depend on the goodwill of not just union members like us, but the public at large, right? That's their bread and butter. They Starbucks can't survive if we don't buy their coffee. So, and same with Amazon, to put it mildly, which it penetrates something like 80% of households with its prime program. You know, I mean, they depend on the goodwill of everyone. And so that's where the opportunity really will be to show what, you know, which side are you on to, to demonstrate that. Um, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank and you. it may never happen. I mean, but- I'd like to think that will come. Thank you, Ruth. I think our last question will be from Michael Engber. Michael? Hi. Hi. I'm wondering if you see any fallout, any consequences of the Janus decision, which you haven't mentioned and well, nobody's mentioned. Yes. Well, it is possible that that dip in the public sector union density that I showed you earlier, it's could be a delayed reaction to Janice. I mean, I think the unions really did step up in most cases to try to get people to sign up as members. Certainly our union did and many others, but um, I don't really know. I mean, that it is obviously an ongoing challenge compared to the days when you could have an agency shop, that's over. And so it, that might have an impact. I got some pushback from um, Vinny Alvarez for suggesting that there is a sentence in the report that perhaps this is a delayed reaction to Janice, but it's true that I don't have any evidence of that. Um, so maybe everybody knows what Janice was, right? The Supreme Court decision that um, basically created the entire public sector as an open shop, not allow, not allowing union security measures in, in public sector agreements like we had for so many years. Um, so that's a, you know another one on the long list of challenges that remain. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, Ruth, uh, thank you so much for a very important and interesting presentation. I know uh, you could have spoken to us for twice or three times the amount of time, uh, but we are very appreciative that you were able to synthesize so much for us in a short time. Thank you to those who asked questions. And um, if you want to read the full report that Ruth is taking this data from, I guess you can let us know and we could get it out to people, okay? It's actually in the chat, the link, if anyone okay, it's um, in the chat. is eager to see it and Great. it's easy to find. So anyway, thank you for inviting me. And um, I know you have a really important agenda item. Yes. I may become a member of this chapter one day. I'm not thinking about retirement yet, but I'm the age, so we'll see. Uh, anyway. <laughs> this is the best chapter, Ruth, really. It's the best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, next up is somebody you uh, should be familiar with, and that is our PSC president, James Davis. And uh, James is going to talk to us about the slightly bigger context in which we work, and that's the full PSC, uh, what's been going on and where we're going. And he will uh, lead us into, of course, a very important uh, presentation by our healthcare experts on what's what the latest is. So James, where's James? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Thank James. You. It is really good to see so many folks here and thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to thank Anne especially and also um, Bonnie Nelson and Diane Mena for stepping up. And I really also want to shout out Bill Friedheim, your outgoing chapter chair, outgoing in so many senses of the word and outstanding. Um, and you all are continue to be in terrific hands with um, with Anne at the helm. Great chapter. And I also I also want to acknowledge, I don't even know if they're here today, but um, my colleagues on the executive council of the PSC from the retiree chapter, Nancy Romer and, um, and Marva Lilly. So thank you for lending Nancy and Marva to us in the elected central leadership. And let me just also add my thanks to everyone else's for Ruth, for your presentation. It's always really fascinating to see what you unearth in your annual report. And as you pointed out, there are always some surprises. And also this conversation is always so provocative, not only because of the descriptions that you give, but also because the questions and the comments from participants in the meeting are perceptive. So thanks everyone. And I just wanna begin by saying that it's an exciting few weeks here at the PSC because well, for the first time in three years, we had a Labor Day parade. And I know there's some folks who are on this meeting who joined us and we marched 20 blocks up Fifth Avenue over the weekend and it was boisterous and we were loud and we chanted and I'm, I'm still a little bit hoarse, but I think that the buildings on Fifth Avenue are still echoing from the chants that PSC members did. And it was really special to be out there again um, with organized labor, or as some people like to call it, disorganized labor, whatever you want to say. It was great to be out after a three-year hiatus and seeing so many folks new and veterans to the PSC. We got to unfurl our 50th anniversary um, banner and march behind the 50th anniversary banner. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had a union-wide picnic. Again, I saw some of you at that picnic in Prospect Park to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the PSC. And we're gonna, of course, hold a more formal celebration of the 50th anniversary um, in a rooftop in downtown Manhattan on September 22nd. So a lot of exciting things going on to commemorate the incredibly rich history. And all of you in this room know better, even better than I do about what that history represents and looks like. But I know um, as someone who's still relatively new to this position, that those of us in the current elected leadership role stand on the shoulders of some tremendous activists and leadership over the years. So um, look, I wanna try to give you a snapshot today of what's going on and some of the dynamics in the PSC and in the city. And I, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging at the start that it's been a real, just state the obvious, it's been a really tough couple of years under COVID at CUNY. And I just think we have to, you know, recognize that at the outset. And it continues to, you know, COVID continues to rear its ugly head when we think we're moving through and CUNY management always seems to find some way to do as little as possible and to destabilize us. So it's been very, very challenging. And now here comes along this New York City health insurance issue where the Municipal Labor Committee has consented 
to the request from the city's Office of Labor Relations to move, uh, to approve a change that's gonna go to the city council next. And we're gonna talk about what the implications are, um, you know, if this were to be approved. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a strategy that the PLC is developing for, um, for fighting back and struggling against it. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about this at the end of my remarks and then Debbie Bell, the former executive director of the PSC and Dean Hubbard, the current executive director are gonna elaborate and follow up. So, it, you know, the, the main thing I hope that you'll take away when we get to this is that this is, not, um, this is not a retiree issue anymore. Not that if it were only a retiree issue, retiree issue that it wouldn't be worth fighting for, but this is why this has become an issue for um, active, members and retirees alike. So before getting to that specific issue, let me just, as I said, try to take a step back and paint a little bit of a picture where things stand today. And I hope that some of my remarks provoke you to think about ways that you can continue to involve yourself in what the PSC is doing. You have an extremely active chapter, arguably the most active chapter, despite not being actively employed among the most active chapters in the entire um, PSC. There are lots of ways for you to be involved and stay involved and to make a real impact in the university that we know that you love and still care about deeply. So I wanna present in, in a couple of, um, couple of categories first, and I'm gonna share my screen. I don't have the fancy PowerPoint that Ruth shared with you, mine looks more like a dull Microsoft Word, but I'm gonna still share. And what I wanna share with you is, um, let me see if I can find this. First, I wanna start off by talking about some of the challenges and which you could also call headwinds. And then I'm gonna turn to um, opportunities slash tailwinds, okay? And so it, I'm, I'll make this, I'll enlarge this so that it's visible. Make sure you can all see it. Is that visible on the screen? Somebody yell or yes. give me a yes. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so so listen, some of this you already know about, and I'll, I'll you know I'll run through a bunch of things quickly, and then at the end, of course, you know you can ask me questions, and if we run out of time, I'm going to put my email in the chat, so you can feel free to follow up with me. The economic outlook. Um, being a little cheeky about it here, cloudy with a chance of recession, but the end of the, the end of the federal stimulus funds for the city and the state and for CUNY comes with the fiscal year 2023. So that's, uh, that's tough for probably for obvious reasons. It makes it easier for the state and the city to cry poverty and for CUNY to say, you know, we had this infusion of funds for a few years, but, um, but that's run out. And, and so the, the coffers are empty. You're all familiar, of course, I'm sure with the extraordinary rates of inflation, slightly lower actually in the New York metro area than nationwide, but still much, much higher in the past year and a half than in the previous several years. New York City's fund grew enormously last year. So an increase of over $6 billion in tax revenue. However, like almost all the other city agencies, CUNY was cut by 3%. And some of you are familiar with the PEG, the, the program to eliminate the gap, which was um, Mayor Adams' program and CUNY was not immune to that. And then some of you may have also seen that the state comptroller in late August issued a forecast about New York City's budget gaps, which, you know, forecast that the, those gaps are manageable, but only through fiscal restraint. And he warned specifically that if contractual raises for city workers were to keep pace with projected inflation, then labor costs are going to rise by one and a half billion dollars next year and increase, right, annual increase by 3.6 billion by 2026. In other words, communicating very clearly that the city um, could experience volatility in its fiscal outlook and should plan responsibly. So, you know, one never likes to hear that entering into contract negotiations in the spring because it gives the city pretext to say, 
things are very uncertain. We can't possibly, um, you know, keep up with inflation. Or if we do, we're going to have to find some other way to cut costs or increase revenue. So we could have a fight on our hands, and so could all the other municipal unions. And then the last bullet point here, again, you all know this one already, but it's, it bears um, saying out loud, the likelihood of a recession um, nationwide sometime within the next 12 months. Here's another headwind and challenge. There really is a, a decline in enrollment at CUNY. It's not pervasive, it's not uniform. It's sharpest at the community colleges and to some extent at the comprehensives. The comprehensives, in other words, the four-year colleges that offer associate's degrees too. But it's also been the case at a few of the senior colleges. And it's a challenge both in terms of these colleges themselves, because as, as a source of revenue, um, they rely and project their budgets based on tuition and tuition offsets. But it also sets in place an unfavorable economic and political dynamic for the union where the bosses and you know, various elected officials, et cetera, can point to declining enrollment and say, you know, you're telling us to invest in CUNY, you're telling us you need to, you know, we need to fund your contract, et cetera. But meanwhile, you know, your enrollment is in the toilet. What's going on? So this is, I think there are, are there are answers to this, but uh, but I do not think that the university has been adept at addressing the enrollment decline. I mean, for one thing, there are lots of lots of things to talk about here. But for one thing, uh, you know, uh, there there was a, a program called CUNY Reconnect that put four million dollars towards um, towards bringing students who have some college credits but no diploma back to school this fall. They're like just now getting started on that. Um, there was a lot of funding available from the state as well to recruit and um, make sure students came back and they really missed an opportunity. And the last thing I'll say, um, and, and this is again, this one's tough, but there's a however here that I think is important. In the recent months, in, uh, really this is a COVID induced, pandemic induced um, phenomenon. We have seen a dip, slight dip, but a concerning one if it continues in uh, membership in the union. And really, um, you know, one of, uh, one of the questions earlier to Ruth had to do with Janice, you know, um, obviously we can no longer collect agency fee in the PSC. We always try to sign people up, whether we, you know, whether we could collect agency fee or not. But what's happened over the past couple of years during COVID is a lot of our full-timers and some of our part-timers too, but a lot of our full-timers and the faculty and staff have left for one reason or another, either retired or left to take different jobs. And um, in terms of membership, we have not kept up. And this is really on us. It's one of our priorities this, this year. We have not kept up with trying to sign up new members at the same rates that we have been losing folks to attrition and retirement. So just to put this in concrete terms, in the five semesters during COVID up through last spring, CUNY lost um, 383 full-time faculty members to retirement or other kinds of attrition. And those were all professorial lines. And we believe, we don't have the hard numbers, but we believe that there's something around that same number between three and, three and 400 full-time professional staff. So that's a lot. Um, that's a lot of employees to lose. And it's a lot of union members to lose, right? These are people who, we have between 90 and 96 percent uh, membership rates in our full-time ranks. And so when you lose that many union members, you have to work really hard to make up for it on the flip side and sign people up to join the union. So I can say more about that, but I just wanted to acknowledge and recognize that's a challenge, um, not only in terms of dues revenue, but also because we're heading into another budget campaign and we're heading into a contract campaign and we really need density of membership and solidarity of members um, speaking to one another, right? However, and this is the, um, the, the flip to opportunities and tailwinds, CUNY is hiring for the first time in a long time at a rate that we have not seen. So just again, to put things in concrete terms, CUNY authorized searches 
for um, almost 600 full-time faculty for the current academic year, 475 lecturers, 120 um, professorial lines. And that's fantastic. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about why that's possible this year. But the rough thing about that from our point of view is that we love seeing more full-timers come in, but this is not from our view, a sustainable ratio or an appropriate ratio um, of full-time lines. If we were to continue uh, for the foreseeable future, hiring at a ratio that's basically, what is that, four to one lecturers to professors, we would really be depleting, substantially depleting our professorial lines. So, um, you know, it's very, very good that so many lecturer positions became available in part because a number of our long serving and highly qualified adjunct faculty were, were able to apply for and in many cases obtain um, full time employment that you know structurally had been very difficult for them to achieve because of uh, just how few and far between full time appointments had been recently. It's still it's still not a balance um, of full time appointments that we want to see when we fight for uh, a budget for for new full time hires. And frankly, it's not the proportion that the university originally proposed when it went to the legislature and the governor and said, we need more full-time hiring at CUNY. So that's something we continue um, to need to fight on, but um, it's really, really great to finally see full-time hiring begin to reemerge. I say begin because I think we need to do more. Opportunities and tailwinds. Okay, so this is the rosier side of the equation. I mean, one thing, and you know, you've heard, if you've received any emails from me over the past year, you know that we did not win everything that we felt we needed to, or frankly, that we deserved in the last state budget cycle, but we got a lot of traction on the New Deal for CUNY. And the New Deal for CUNY, it's very easy to, it's, you know, I know legislation is complicated, but it's actually very, very easy to communicate what the New Deal for CUNY is about. It's about getting staffing ratios at a level that our students deserve, and frankly, that we deserve too, for full-time faculty to students, right? Academic advisors to students, mental health counselors to students, pay parity for contingent faculty, and uh, free undergraduate tuition for in-state students like CUNY was for more than a century. Those are the components of the New Deal for CUNY. It's not that difficult to explain. It's politically a challenge to, uh, of course, to win. But we made a lot of progress last year and there was a huge increase in operating funds from previous years, over 200 million new operating dollars and over a billion new dollars in um, capital funding. We're not complacent. We know it's not enough. Um, we're doubling down again with the new deal for CUNY and the, important way that we're doing that is under the next item, which is continuing to build our coalition, which is the CUNY Rising Alliance. I won't dilate about that because I think most folks are familiar with the community and student partnerships that the CUNY Rising Alliance represents. I want to also just flag that we've been working closely with UUP, which is our counterpart union in the SUNY system, closely aligned with them last cycle, did some events with them, and we're again in conversations with UUP um, to try to allow um, NYSIT to be a strong advocate for all the community colleges and the public higher ed institutions in the city and the state. And then the other thing I would flag here, um, and Marsha actually wrote ab about this in her report, I don't know if it was out yet in the retiree newsletter, but one of the one of the things that the AFT convention um, that happened over the summer was the affiliation of the a AUP with the AFT. And um, again, you know, I could talk about this at greater length, but for the sake of time, I'll just flag this because I think it's very promising um, in terms of, you know, the opportunities it's going to prevent present to organize to do new organizing around the country in higher education and to do new organizing of what we sometimes call advocacy chapters and not collective bargaining chapters in states where they're prohibited or not prohibited, but where there's no enabling legislation to do collective bargaining. 
there'll be greater opportunities because of the muscle and the resources that the AFT has um, to do new organizing in higher ed, higher ed around the country, which is terrific. And then I think on the flip side of it, AFT, um, I believe that the result here is going to be to um, exert additional pressure on the AFT to prioritize higher education. So that's a good thing. A couple other things. Um, one is, and this is, I mentioned before, critically important. Um, you know, there's nothing that galvanizes the attention of the membership of the union around the union like a contract campaign. And we're really excited in the leadership to be at this point um, in our contract campaign where we have so far uh, conducted a contract priority survey. More than 9,000 PSC members participated in that survey at the end of the spring. Um, nice, it helped us administer it. Really, really rich set of data that's both quantitative and also we had open field responses for qualitative, uh, qualitative input. So we, we've been working through that, really fascinating. And uh, I should also point out that lots of constituency groups have sent the leadership and notified us outside of the survey about your priorities. And that includes the retirees, um, the leadership of which sent us um, a really good series of um, retiree chapter priorities for the next contract. We developed uh, a structure uh, on, on each campus called Campus Action Teams. They formed at every college last spring. These are going to be even more critical as we head into the spring 2023 semester. The contract expires at the end of February 2023. It's going to be very important that the basic unit of our union is so important to have strong chapters right at the chapter level and we have campus action teams working uh, locally both to get input from their colleagues and also uh, to scale up the campaign that the central union is developing the principal officers attended dozens of chapter meetings in the spring we're going to continue to do that this fall i'm going out for the first time ever to in person to Queensboro Community College in a couple of weeks. Um, not sure where my next one is, but I'm hoping that all the officers are going to continue to be invited to the campuses and talk about what folks need to see in the next contract. We're going to have a mass meeting. I hope all of you will come. Uh, it's going to be Zoom uh, Wednesday in the evening of Wednesday, October 26. The mass meeting is going to be on winning a just contract. And at the end of the semester, we're going to circulate a petition, um, which is CUNY must come to the bargaining table. Because as you know, and they're enabled in this by the tribal uh, agreement, but uh, that when our contract expires, um, we, we want CUNY to be uh, available and eager to join us at the bargaining table um, when our contract expires, if not sooner. So we're going to circulate a a member petition, which is also another way to organize, organize for the contract. Here's a few other things. And um, Anne, if you can just tell me if I'm running out of time and I'll cut to the chase. Yeah, if you could, um, you know, cut wrap to the this chase. up, res yeah. yeah. I'll do it, okay. Cut to the chase. And okay, so <laughs> I, again, I'm happy to happy to share this otherwise, but for the, for the sake of time, um, I'll just point out, you know, we've had, we've had progress that's been really important even in the summer, um, heading into the fall semester, fighting off can cancellations of classes. I mentioned the enrollment decline before. Um, the remote work agreement, which some of you are familiar with, was scheduled to sunset at the end of the summer. The university agreed to extend it through the fall, and we have an opportunity to renegotiate that. Health and safety continues, you know, with an employer like CUNY and an infrastructure, the physical infrastructure that is... I'll use a kind word for it and say uneven across the system as ours is. Um, there's no end of health and safety issues. Uh, many of you know that we filed a lawsuit under Article 78 to try to forestall the way that CUNY implemented its vaccine mandate. Um, we favored a vaccine mandate, but not the way that CUNY implemented it. 
Meanwhile, we have not seen any attempts to terminate employees for not complying with the vaccine mandate. Our position remains not to fire, not to fire people, um, but we have not seen CUNY move to discipline anyone. There are a lot of local struggles that I won't have time here to talk about, but I, I did want to highlight them and I won't speak about them. But again, back to this point that it's our local chapter struggles that often that's where that's where people involve themselves with the, in the union, right? It's what is happening in their chapters, in their in their campuses. And so there's a lot happening in our campuses. As we speak, my home chapter is in the street on Bedford Avenue, actually demonstrating because the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department there has been so systematically starved for senior faculty on tenure lines for so long. One example of many. There are other things that, uh, that I wanted to flag and I won't for the sake of time about our legislative campaigns. We've really ramped up um, our ledge committee work. Um, one thing that's going on right now, I'll just shout out what's happening with the public service loan forgiveness. Ask you to pay attention when you receive emails from us about that. It's exciting what's going on there at the federal level and about to expand at the state level. What does it all mean? It means that we're prepared. All of the progress on taking advantage of the opportunities and the tailwinds, I think that I'm not alone when I say that all of those efforts, they directly help our members, but just as importantly, when our members are involved, they experience their agency in those struggles. So those folks who are fighting for transparency in the disbursement of the travel funds at Ostos Community College, it's a small thing, but they experience their agency when they get that win, right? And the, and the folks at LaGuardia who staved off some of the worst draconian class cancellations experience that progress. That helps to build our internal solidarity and our organizing base. So I'll stop with that and I'll just turn to um, the issue that is topmost of mind, I know with a lot of retirees, which is this proposed change. And Debbie and Dean are gonna talk a little bit about it, but I wanted, to, um, I wanted to just try to distill down a few points and then talk briefly about uh, our, um, our strategy, at least in the coming days and weeks, okay? Um, I'm gonna say a couple maybe elementary things that uh, will be familiar to those of you who have been tuned in to the struggle and I'm not gonna go deep, deep into the background for the sake of time, but people should feel free to ask follow-up questions. And as I said, Dean and Debbie will elaborate. A lot of you know that several, several years ago, the Municipal Labor Committee entered into a, a healthcare savings agreement with the city where the MLC basically agreed to be, to give, to achieve savings, to find, to find savings, right? Of $1.1 billion over three years with $600 million coming in 2021 and then 600 million thereafter. So it's a, it's a, you know, a, a, a high bar for what the healthcare cost savings the MLC agreed to with the city. And um, this is why we ended up with the Medicare Advantage proposal that a lot of you are familiar with. Medicare Advantage was arrived at as the big cost saving, not the only one, but the chief cost saving measure um, that the city and the city uh, office of labor relations and the MLC um, uh, agreed to until it was stopped in court. And a lot of you were involved in many ways in the activism around that. This chapter was very vocal and um, very principled about um, their opposition. So what would happen if the administrative code were changed. Well, the whole reason why the city's Office of Labor Relations asked the MLC to uh, take a vote to support this change to the administrative code is that it would effectively clear the path. And Bob Nelson wrote uh, a very succinct summary on the DA list serve about it. And I think um, Bill and Ann posted it again on the Retiree Chapter website. I would encourage you to, to read it. I mean, what it basically the administrative code will do, the effect will be to clear the path for the Medicare Advantage um, plan to be adopted and it would move the judge's decision um, that, that's, that had stopped the implementation of the plan for all municipal retirees. 
there is a hearing on appeal, um, right? That the organization, uh, that the retiree organization, um, uh, public service retirees have brought, they're the plaintiffs in the case, the city appealed that, that ruling of Judge Frank and that, that's, gonna, that's scheduled for sometime in October, but in effect that would um, make, make that appeal irrelevant because um, the, the administrative code on which Judge Frank issued the ruling uh, would be amended. If it were approved, um, our concern, right, is that an important safeguard would be removed. Um, and that safeguard in the current administrative plan um, obligates the city to pay a certain minimum reimbursement rate for any health insurance plan. And that minimum obligation, it's tied to 100% uh, of whatever HIP HMO plays. And so they pays. So they refer to that as the benchmark and what the change in the administrative code does, and it's really just one sentence, but what it effectively does is it opens the door to alternative benchmark plans. It could be a new benchmark plan set for retirees and their dependents. Another benchmark plan could potentially be set for active members, employees, and their dependents. There's a lot of political momentum now behind this change to the administrative code. Um, this is why it's so difficult and challenging. The mayor's behind it. Apparently the city council speaker is behind it. And now it's got the imprimatur of the MLC, despite the fact that 11 of us member unions in the MLC voted no, the overwhelming majority voted yes. And then probably goes without saying, but we have a massive health insurance company in Aetna waiting in the wings, right? Um, salivating because they can't wait, I'm sure, to get its hands on the Medicare Advantage Plus contract that will be coming its way. Uh, if this goes through, if, if the administrative code is changed, Medicare Advantage can be implemented. Um, Emblem and Anthem, which was the, with the alliance that uh, was originally contracted, they withdrew during the controversy over the lawsuit. And Aetna is surely in the mix somewhere pushing um, you know, for the administrative code change. Next steps will involve city council. No change to the administrative code can happen before the city council can review and approve. And city council uh, is obligated to hold two public hearings. Um, our understanding, and we're still confirming this, our understanding, people, other people on the call may know more than I do, is that city council's finance committee is going to be the committee convening those hearings. So what is our strategy going forward? I just wanna put it in kind of a thumbnail sketch. Um, and then I wanna, I wanna actually, before, before we go to questions, I think it would probably be good to go to Dean and Debbie um, because they can unpack some of this, but I did think, I thought it'd be helpful for people to hear, um, you know, our, our um, approach in terms of our targets. So, it's our analysis that right now, um, you know, the, the leaders of the labor unions that have pushed this and the leaders of the MLC obviously are supporting this, um, you know, for reasons that, um, that I think they believe in and they're legitimate. They are trying to save the stabilization fund within the MLC. They have taken what I think they, they believe is a very pragmatic approach to, um, you know, you know, the saving the stabilization fund and doing as little damage as possible from their point of view um, to uh, the future health care for retirees and members. And they've been told that the city won't begin collective bargaining until um, there's some satisfaction that the MLC is willing to live up to its obligations. On their savings. So, you know, that's the barrel that they feel they're over. Uh, we disagree. Obviously, we've you know, been, we've been um, outspoken about that within the MLC and, and, you know, and publicly. So, but in terms of the targets for the campaign uh, now, you know, the, the city council finance committee really need to hear from uh, opponents of the proposed change. So PSC members and retirees are going to receive a follow-up email from me this week, hopefully, very, very soon, 
um, with an act now, which is just, you know, that, that you can click here to send uh, a letter. You're welcome to send your own letters, of course, but often people find it easier to do it that way with an email, how to contact the finance committee of the city council directly. There are 17 members of city council. Um, you know, they, we, we, we need to try to persuade them that this is a terrible idea. Um, PSC members will also be invited to testify at the two public hearings. Um, our legislative director is um, looking into when those finance committee hearings are going to be held. And then, um, and then I will also be directly in touch with the members of the finance committee. Um, and Barbara Bowen may, um, may also be in contact with them because she remains our representative to the steering committee of the MLC. Those are priority targets, but there's also secondary targets, which are all the other members of the council. And we feel especially the council members who have influence, who have appointments to other committees that are relevant here. So for example, there's a committee on aging, right? In the city council, there's a committee on civil service and labor, right? And we want those committee chairs to know um, what the basis of our opposition with, you know, from the PSC, what's the basis of the opposition and what are the alternatives? Because if folks feel that they're boxed in, whether the council members feel that way or the unions who are supporting this feel that there are just no other alternatives, we wanna make the case that there are alternatives to that. PSC members and retirees are gonna receive the Act Now letter to email all of their, uh, all their city council members, whether they are on the finance committee or not. There's also other MLC union leaders, right, who, who uh, also voted no and some who abstained. Uh, and even some, there are members, and some of you know this, there are members and retirees of other unions whose leadership voted to support, but whose rank and file members and retirees are organizing to, um, to oppose. And so we feel, you know, the elected leadership will continue to reach out to and look for support and build allies among other unions who opposed or dissented in one way or another. And also uh, we know that, you know, those of you in, in the retiree chapter and other rank and file members will continue to reach out to your counterparts in other unions as well. We're very interested finally in placing op-eds and contacting editorial boards because, I mean, some of you saw the Daily News editorial probably yesterday, which was basically, you know, totally in lockstep with, um, you know, the city's labor relations office and what's needed to achieve uh, healthcare savings and Medicare Advantage needs to happen. And so the administrative code should be changed. Um, so some public pressure around changing the narrative is critically important right now. And that is all I have for now. Um, and again, I know I'm sure there's lots to discuss here. I want to thank everybody for, um, well, for your invitation, because I've just said a lot, and especially for your interest in, um, in this final item. And I think Dean and uh, Debbie will say a bit more before we open things up, if that's okay. Yes, thank you so much, James. I think we'll hear from Dean and Debbie very briefly and then open the questions for you, for them. Uh, I think Bettina's here also. So thanks a lot, James. So great. Debbie is gonna lead us off. Okay, great. Uh, so, we have to take down your screen, uh, James. Screen share. Sorry about that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to just before Dean goes into some of the follows up on some of the next steps, give you some background on where things have moved over the summer. James gave a very thorough uh, discussion of what's going on with the administrative code. I wanted to just explain to you that why are we worried about the administrative code? Um, health coverage for municipal employees predates collective bargaining. It was embedded in law and law in New York City is the administrative code. So 
if you look in our contract, if you look in almost any city contract, there is no language about regular straightforward health insurance for full-time municipal employees. It's all driven by what is in the law. Um, that law says that the city is obliged to pay the HIP HMO rate for coverage for all active employees, retirees, and dependents. Now the HIP HMO rate is $700 a month. The public service retiree group, when they went to court last year said, wait a minute, why are people being charged for senior care if they opt out of the Medicare Advantage plan and being told they're gonna to have to pay $190 a month if the HIP HMO rate is so much higher and they're entitled to that coverage and for the city to pay for it. This sort of helps explain the financial push about why the city is so serious about changing this language and put so much pressure on the MLC unions to make the change. The idea that their big idea was they were gonna save money through the MA for the Medicare Advantage plan. And if people didn't wanna take it and they wanted to stay in senior care, those people would have to pay part of the premium or the full premium ultimately. Uh, the judge's ruling upended that assumption. That's why the, as James said, the city is desperate to make this change as quickly as possible and before the appellate court has the opportunity to hear all the arguments. Um, I'm gonna let D Dean follow up on that, but I did wanna give you a brief update on Medicare Advantage generally. As James suggested, the city has followed up on the fact that last July, Anthem and Empire Blue Cross were the same thing, pulled out of the Alliance and pulled out of the Medicare Advantage Plus plan that they'd negotiated with the city of New York. So everything had been on hold in the spring pending the lawsuit. Now it's even further on hold because there is no Medicare Advantage plan yet to enroll retirees into. The city has been negotiating with Aetna. Aetna was the second place bidder last fall and I, we are told that under city rules, the city can uh, negotiate a contract with the second place bidder as long as <clears throat> that original bid is not modified. So that is what they are up to. We don't know any of the details of what Aetna proposed. There is an Aetna at Medicare Advantage plan that, that some retirees have had the opportunity to join. Uh, it used to cost a fair amount of money and then last fall Aetna knocked it down to zero. Um, but we don't know if that's the plan that they bid for. So more info, as soon as we have information, we will get it to you either through a special meeting or through the website or whatever. What we do know is that it is unlikely that any Medicare Advantage plan would go into place before April 1 of 2023 and more likely July 1 of 2023. Um, we don't know what uh, the senior care premium if you opt out would be. I would assume it would be similar to what it was last year, $190, perhaps a titch higher because we're, we are a year further along and health care prices are rising. Um, but the city has said that they will continue to offer senior care and hip VIP as alternatives to Medicare Advantage going forward. In addition, last year's opt-outs are canceled, no good. You know, we're gonna to have to go through a whole new process of education about whatever this new Medicare Advantage plan is. Retirees making a decision to be moved into it or to opt out. So that opt-out process will be brand new. Anything you've done previously does not count. Um, as I, again, as soon as we have more information, we will post it. And if it seems appropriate, ask Ann to call a special meeting. Um, and now let me throw it to Dean to follow up on um, the immediate issues surrounding the, what we have to do about the administrative code change. Great, um, thanks a lot, Debbie. I am gonna share my screen with the 
um, proposed change to the city administrative code. So you can see it. Um, hang on a second, see if I can find it for you here. I thought I had it open. My apologies. Looks like I have to open it again. While we're waiting, you can probably see boxes behind uh, Dean. And if you didn't know, the PSC just moved uh, our whole operation across the street from 61 Broadway to 25 Broadway. That's right. We oh. are in a temporary location at 25 Broadway. Um, and we are building a new space and we will, are hoping to, it's on the 15th floor here at 25 Broadway. It's gonna be a beautiful brand new union hall among other things and um, hoping to move into that early next year. Um, so can folks see this? Um, if you could make it a little bigger. Uh, yeah, how's that? I guess for me, that's good. Uh, okay, let's just make it. A little tiny bit bigger. Okay. So um, this is the law that all the sound and fury is about. Um, you can see the underlying portion and lines eight to eleven is the, the is the language that the city and the MLC are proposing to add. And Debbie, I think, did a really good job of explaining um, why uh, they are doing this. Um, Again, the city and the MLC are unhappy that Judge Frank interpreted this law as requiring the city to pay the cost of senior care uh, up to the HIP HMO amount, um, which is really the plain language of the statute. Um, so what they've done is they have come up with this language that allows them to create a class of individuals um, jointly agreed upon by the city and the MLC and establish a benchmark plan for that class and say the city has to pay the full cost of whatever that benchmark plan is. Now, there's a separate letter that the city and the MLC have signed that says a couple of things that are important. One, it says that they will not implement any such change without the agreement of the MLC and that that can't be imposed through impasse resolution procedures. So the, the MLC is making a big deal out of the fact that any change like this would have to be negotiated. Um, but from our perspective, um, the, the big problem with is this is it really takes away the cost of the HIP HMO, which as Debbie mentioned is over $700 as a floor. Um, and it throws whatever amount the city is supposed to contribute towards the cost of health insurance open to bargaining, right? So that means if the city has leverage over the key unions in the MLC, they can agree to establish a benchmark plan um, that has a, a lower cost that the city will cover than the HIP HMO plan. Um, so the other piece that the city and the MSC clarified in their letter is there's basically only two classes that they could establish. One class would be actives in their dependents and the other would be retirees in their dependents. Now it's clear that what they are going after right now in the short term is being able to establish the Medicare Advantage plan that they hope to enter into a contract with Aetna for as the benchmark for retirees. And therefore they would not have to pay the cost of senior care. Um, so that, if, you know, from their perspective and the perspective of an insurance company that wants to administer the Medicare Advantage, um, they don't, you know, they want to force people into the Medicare Advantage. And if people have to pay to opt out, then it'll be obviously much um, more likely that people opt into Medicare Advantage. Um, so, but obviously, 
the reason that Debbie says this is, and James says this is no longer just a retiree issue, it never was just a retiree issue. All you folks were saying from the beginning, hey, actives should be aware because you're next. Well, indeed, now it's clear that, um, uh, you know, with this change to the law, the city and the MLC could agree to a change what the city pays for coverage for active employees as well. Um, so that's kind of what's at stake here. Um, in terms of what we're planning to do, I think James actually did a really good job of telling you, you know, what our plan is, what our strategy is. Um, the thing, the big thing to watch out for from us next is an act now letter that we will be circulating to all actives and retirees. And it'll be uh, for a letter for you to sign that will go to um, the, mem the members of the city council finance committee, which is the committee that we have been told will be having the hearings about this change to the law. Um, and then we'll target other council members um, who have relevant committee appointments or significant influence uh, with an example being Carmen de la Rosa, who chairs the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Um, so, um, Debbie, unless you think there's anything else that we need to cover, I think it'd probably be a good time to turn it over to folks for questions. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, please again raise your hand uh, in, in, on your raise your hand, your Zoom hand, uh, and uh, I will call on, I guess, usually a bill I think has done three questions. We'll get three questions and then we'll see who wants to answer them. Uh, and please try to keep your questions to being questions and no longer than a minute and a half. Okay, so first will be uh, Robert Cowan, then Le Leonard Rodberg, and Lester Jacobs. So can we unmute Bob Cowan? Yes, thank you. Um, the first thing I would like, I think it would be useful to develop a list of our PSC members by council districts. And that way, instead of receiving one or two letters, perhaps we can organize meetings of 20 people going to see the council person. And I think that would be much more effective. So uh, if that's possible, that would be a very uh, worthwhile organizing tool. Second thing I want to mention is self-insurance. Um, we should, I think, mention there a way to save money other than uh, this Medicare advantage is for the city to self-insure. This has been shown to work numerous places to save money. So I would hope this would also be stressed. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Len Rodberg. Yeah, just a point, a point of information. Um, I think we've discussed Medicare Advantage a lot and know over the past year and a half, and we know it's an advertising term, but let's be clear, it represents a 25% cut in the amount of money available for retirees, if it were to be implemented. Um, it is re it's real money. The city is saving money on the backs of retirees. And if you're healthy, it won't affect you much. When you get sick, you will suffer and people will die. And they'll die in inequitably because the present plan covers all 250,000 retirees, 65,000 of us uh, had sufficient funds to be willing to opt out and pay the $2,200 or $2,300 a year to uh, keep senior care. The other three quarters are not in the same economic bracket that most academics are when they retire, and they will suffer. And there's interest, good data on that. Uh, we got to fight this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Uh, Lester Jacobs. Hi. Um, I wanted to make a comment about Aetna Medicare Advantage, um, which my wife and I have had since we retired, and we, we had Aetna prior to that. First of all, the cost before they dropped it to zero was $92 a month, which is not terribly outrageous. 
Second, it happens to be an excellent insurance plan. However, and this is the big however, and Debbie really talked about it, who knows what Aetna is negotiating with the city at the current time. If it's the plan we have, I would be very happy with it, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be. I do have a question. Is the union um, working at all to decouple um, the welfare fund from staying in the city's insurance plan? My understanding is if someone wanted to opt out entirely from the city's uh, insurance plan, let's say, and buy United Healthcare, that they would lose welfare fund benefits. Is anyone working on that right now? Okay, so um, we have a couple of suggestions, uh, list of members by council districts, uh, self-insurance, some information from Len um, and a question about uh, is the union in any way discussing decoupling the welfare fund from the city's insurance plan? So I don't know who wants to take that question. Debbie? Is that okay, Dean? I can't see Dean, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, if it's okay, Anne, I can suggest some folks to answer. Um, uh, with respect to Bob Cowan's question about uh, PSC members and council districts, um, Bettina or Tiffany, would you uh, take that one and maybe just talk a little bit about some of what we're thinking of in terms of targeting council members? Um, uh, Debbie, if on the self-insurance question, maybe you could talk briefly about the presentation that we made to Klinger and the MLC consultants on different alternatives um, uh, to, uh, to Medicare Advantage. Um, and then on the decoupling question, I don't think Donna's on the call. So unless she, if she is, she would be the one to answer that. And if not, Debbie, do you mind taking a crack at that one too? Sure. So Bettina, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so yes, the way we will be reaching out to members is through our database, which breaks things up in a variety of different ways, including council districts um, and also where people, uh, their campuses are. So there'll be a variety of ways for us to get to not only leaders within the city council, like the speaker and the mayor, but to drill down to leaders of committees, members of certain committees. Um, there'll be a lot of ways for us to dice that up. So yes, we will certainly be targeting them more than one way. I hope that answered your question. Okay, I'll talk. Um, we have the PSC, as you know, has opposed the Medicare Advantage idea for over a year. Um, and as part of that opposition, we have uh, James and Dean and Barbara Bowen in her role as an MLC steering committee member, we've pushed for meetings with um, uh, decision makers among the MLC with regard to the fact that there really are alternatives, one of which, as Bob Cowan suggests, is self-insurance. It is um, less of an alternative than we or originally thought because uh, all the current the current plan that active employee, the most active employees are in, which is GHI Empire, the CBP plan, is a minimum premium plan, which means that um, the big, the bulk of initial savings available from going to self-insurance, which is not having to pay taxes, has already been largely achieved uh, through the, I won't bore you all with the technical details of the distinctions, um, we are, however, continuing to press for, for self-insurance because we believe that um, there, the city needs to actually play a much more aggressive role in determining what, uh, you know, city has uh, 1.25 million participants. We can exercise, the city can exercise a lot of leverage in the city's healthcare market, um, and they're not doing it. And uh, uh, they should begin to do it and self-insurance gives them a little bit more of a lever to do it 
so that they can negotiate directly with hospitals and providers. So it's an ongoing uh, effort on the PSC's part. I have to say that um, because there is no locus of health policy inside the city or even inside the MLC um, of, of, of staff who understand policy and fi health finance in a, in a granular way, um, there, this has not gotten a lot of traction. The, the, the general impetus is just to keep things going as they are and put band-aids here and there. Um, the issue of decoupling the welfare fund from the city plan, uh, the union has not been pursuing. It is uh, not something I suspect that the PSC can pursue individually. Uh, it's contractual. It's uh, I, I and I'm not going to put words words in Donna Costa's mouth. That I'll, I'll raise with her. The, I'll let her know this question was raised, but uh, it's not one we're pursuing, and I think would be very difficult, and perhaps um, uh, not a positive move. It's a, you know for the plan generally to pursue. But I will point out that it was raised. I know it's been raised. People have expressed over the past year concerned that they might, if we, they drop city health plan, they would lose their welfare fund benefits. Um, so I will ask her to uh, research, continue to research that and be prepared to talk about that at a next meeting. She did ask me to remind the retirees because I asked, should I report on what the federal IRA plan, which does some things with retiree health, um, that is not gonna take effect until January 1. She will be at a, at a meeting before then to talk about whatever uh, effects that will have on drug costs for retirees. Um, but she did ask me to raise with you all the fact that the dental benefits as of July 1 under the Welfare Fund are significantly improved. And therefore, next time you go to the dentist or if you've been to the dentist since July 1, you should check the website and make sure that um, your, dental, your dental practice is not overcharging you for things that in fact are now covered or covered better, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, I see uh, Dave Cuddlechuk, Bonnie Nelson, and then Mike Frank. Dave? Dave needs to be unmuted. Dave, I just asked you to unmute. Could you unmute? Dave, you have to unmute. Unmute. Thank Good. you. There Thank you go. I have a question that is essentially a legal question, but I, I'm puzzled by it. And whether the legal folks associated with us and others have looked into it. There are, we estimate, a quarter of a million people who are retired city employees. Um, now, at the time Judge Frank ruled in March, the law was, the charter was what it was and had no provision for this look back. Um, and the question is, the court is asked to uphold the judge's ruling. Um, my understanding, but I'm not a lawyer, is that you can't go pass a law later to look back and say, um, you know, you guys, um, you guys are now covered by this change. In other words, are the quarter of a million people who are retired now, um, can there, there, uh, it seems to me that the, the law may not allow a rollback of those people. Um, and I would appreciate if, we talk to our lawyers and other lawyers about that. It may be my inadequate knowledge of, of, of the law. And I will say, I'm not looking for this. I'm in this fight for everybody. I always have been, and I always will continue to be. But you can't, you can't, you can't, you, the principle of ex post facto is so basic to American law that I don't know, and I'd like to ask Debbie um, or, or uh, um, Debbie or Bean, have the lawyers looked into this? Okay, uh, Bonnie. Um, I have a question also about the change in the law. Um, 
the ch the change in the administrative code says now there can be different classes. And my understanding is that the letter that the MLC signed with Office of Labor Relations says that they will only have two classes. One is actives and one is retirees. But it takes an, an action of the city council to change the administrative code, but wouldn't it only take a uh, negotiation between the city and the MLC to change that letter and therefore allow for there to be many more classes? So couldn't we then have classes of newly hired people or classes of part-timers or all kinds of classes for whom they can have a new benchmark? And doesn't that only take an act agreement between the MLC and the city? Thank you. Very, very important question, Bonnie. Okay, Mike, Frank. Okay. Um, my question is to uh, James on strategy or tactics for opposing the, um, the change in the administrative code. James, if I understood you, you mentioned two, uh, two strategies. One, contacting members of the city council and secondly, testify, testifying at city council meetings. Both of those things would remain invisible to the majority of union members who are affected and potentially affected by this, in addition to the 250,000 retirees and to the public at large. Would our union and the 11 unions who voted against this consider mobilizing their own members for demonstrations outside the city council meetings, right? To bring it, but to bring this to broad public attention. Thank you. Uh, I, okay. I think, um, I think D, we do have a labor lawyer in the house and that's our executive director, uh, Dean, I don't know if you want to take that first question. From sure, I'll, I'll try both Dave and Bonnie's questions. Okay. Um, and then um, James can take Mike's question. Um, so on Dave's question, um, generally, um, court decisions are not applied retroactively unless the court specifically says that it has retroactive application. So in this case, um, uh, if, if there was a challenge to the, let's say the council passes this change that um, the city and the MLC want. Um, and first of all, that, that change would only be applied retroactively. I mean, prospectively, sorry, not retroactively. It would be applied from whatever the effective date of the law is going forward. So they wouldn't be able to look back and say, you know, retroactively change, you know, whatever the city's contributing to people's benefits. But I don't think, I think the argument that Dave is making is probably slightly different and more um, uh, resembling the argument that was made by the retirees in the case heard by Judge Frank in which the retirees argued that um, health benefits for retirees should be considered to be vested uh, and not changeable along the lines of pension benefits. Um, the court, Judge Frank rejected that argument. He said, no, healthcare is different from pensions. Um, and uh, the, the retirees actually took an appeal of Judge Frank's uh, decision on that issue and so that will be heard by the appellate division in October so we'll we'll see what they think of that argument um, with respect to with respect to Bonnie's point about um, the um, agreement between the city and the MLC to limit the application of the um, change to the code to just two classes basically actives in their dependents and retirees in their dependents. Um, yeah, that's my understanding. Any agreement that the city and the MLC make, they can later change by agreement. Um, and it, you know, the argument the MLC makes is that the letter would be part of the legislative history, um, but um, 
Sheet Bonnie is absolutely correct that the city and the LLC could could change their agreement at any time. Um, so that's my shot at those two questions. Thanks. Uh, is James still here? I'm here. Can okay. You hear me? Yes, you heard the question about um, mobilizing. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it from Mike, and you know Debbie might want to come in on this or on the previous one that Dean just answered. Um, Mike. Yeah, thanks. I take your point on that. Um, I I don't totally agree with you that on, on you know on the characterization that you know there's rel there's relatively little value in members you know testifying. Uh, I don't I don't think it's right to say that's invisible, um, but I understand what you're asking about mobilizing. Um, you know I it's. It's very tricky because the MLC, you know, we have we've actually been far more aggressive and public in our opposition than most unions, and um, that is that's already out there. Um, and some unions that were, you know, were I would say more vocal in opposition in the early stages of this um, are no longer. Um, for example, Nisna voted yes on this one. So before you know, I make a commitment to you here about where, how are we gonna get out and be public as a union, um, I wanna know who else among the unions is with us because it, it may sound namby-pamby to say it, but there are political costs to not just us here sitting in these offices, but to our members and retirees if we're the only union, uh, out, qua union out there in the way that I think you're describing. So, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't wanna say no to what you're proposing. I think we have to figure out what the other unions who are opposed are also willing to do. And we're figuring that out right now. I was surprised, I was surprised to see some unions that uh, whose leadership went along in support. I was surprised in the other direction. So there were a couple of DC 37 locals who broke away from the lockstep support of DC 37 and voted no. And they were very vocal on the floor of the MLC. So, um, you know, I think figuring out who our allies are and what terms they're willing to engage this is part of being strategic, not just firing from the hip. But I think we do want to continue to be aggressive on this, but be thoughtful about how we approach that question of, of um, being public as a union. But I think, you know, the positions that we put out are available. Um, I'm certain that the uh, MLC leadership have taken note. Uh, Did you want to come in on either of those? I think maybe, I didn't want to cut off Debbie from either of those questions. The only point I would make is that what we've seen is that the unions that voted no, that did not vote no last time, you know, in the initial proposal on Medicare Advantage are unions that represent uh, retirees who were quite active in the public service retiree group. Uniformed officers, lieutenants, captains, sergeants, fire officers, firefighters, uh, EMS, EMTs. Um, so the noise that their retiree members made affected their leaders. Um, that noise has not affected the big uh, unions that have a lot of votes in the MLC, um, like the UFT, even though there were a lot of teachers who were part of that um, public service retiree group. So it's, it's difficult to understand exactly um, what's gonna have a positive effect, but I think James's statement that let's take the narrative as publicly as we can uh, make sense and let's involve active employees so they understand that this is about them, not just when they retire, but it's a, these are strategies that are gonna affect them directly uh, going forward. James, let me just, before I call on Robert, uh, you said NISNA, that's the, the nurses union, right? Correct. How big is the nurses union, Debbie? Isn't that a pretty big one? Well, anyway, I mean, it's about it's about uh, pro, it used to be about thirty five hundred people nurses in city employment. They work in H H and H and uh, the Department of Health. 
Right. And they voted no. They voted, they voted yes. yes. They voted yes. They voted no last time, the first time around, and yes this time. That's a disappointment. Okay, I see Robert Lanson. It would be very helpful if we were to write letters to the city council and, and others, if we had some data rather than simply giving an emotional response to the fact that uh, the city is overstepping it, it, its bounds. Um, is there any way, for example, that they could provide evidence in terms of which hospitals are supporting uh, the Medicare Advantage program uh, versus which ones are not? Uh, a number of colleagues have commented that their doctors and hospitals are not um, taking advantage of the, the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, one final point, and that is, uh, I would suggest a name for this particular uh, approach, and that is free ain't free. Uh, the Medicare Advantage may appear to be free, but in the long run, it's gonna be coming out of the pocket of, it, of its members. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, should I just respond briefly to that because I don't see other hands up? Yes. I mean, Robert, the, the last thing you said reminds us all, I think, of a much bigger picture here, which is that the PSC, our position as a union, supports single payer national health care. And that's our long term goal. So, what we're doing now is to try to solve a problem at the local level, we're in the middle of this pickle and we do have to try to fight it, um, but we can't lose sight of a longer term strategy on, an, on a state and national level to get single payer in place. On the first thing that you raised, the reason it's difficult to express data, the specific data that you've said is that Aetna will enter into a contract with different terms than the one, I mean, we don't know the terms yet that Aetna, uh, you know, the Aetna contract will include in it different from uh, what Emblem Anthem, the Alliance had. They made a lot of claims about how many doctors would accept Medicare Advantage. And we, we imagine the same song and dance or struggle will take place um, with the Aetna plan. Um, but I think that's why it's difficult to say empirically. And I, I take your, I mean, I think you're right. The more empirical we can be, the more persuasive the letter will be. Um, on that specific example, it's hard to be empirical. I see Cecilia, and I think that will be the last question. I have a question after C Cecilia and then Bill Friedheim. I, and hope you can, I hope you can understand me. I just left my dentist's office and my lip is numb at the moment, but um, I just wanted to say to the people who are on this call now, on this Zoom call now, you can take your own initiative. You don't have to wait for the union to tell you what to do. You can get the name of your city council person just by Googling it. And you can call that person. You can get a group together or your family, your friends, whoever, fellow PSC members, and go see that city council person and tell them your story and why this is not going to be helpful to you at all. The other thing I wanted to say, I just look at the, looked at the uh, members of the um, City Council Finance Committee, and it's, it's chaired by Justin Brennan, who's supposed to be fairly progressive, I understand, and we supported and helped him get over the line. Gail Brewer is there, Diana Ayala, um, Charles Barron. These are people that we have been close to over more than 20, 25 years as their political, as their positions have changed from City Council to state and back again. So uh, do we have a strategy to get to these people who we know have always been our friends? Are we going to be targeting them? What are we going to do with this, this group? Um, we are, Cecilia. We're gonna, we're gonna be targeting them in terms, of, um, it, in terms of Act Now letters from members and testimony at the hearing, um, but also from Central PSC, we're gonna be reaching out to them directly because as you said, these aren't strangers in most cases. Um, so I think you're right to, to point that out. Thank you. I think Bill, Bill Friedheim. Yeah, my question, well, I'm gonna write, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question, but uh, I'm also gonna make an exhortation if I'm allowed to. And even if I'm not allowed to, I'm gonna make an exhortation. The question is how do we increase our visibility, our agency, 
um, the noise we make. Um, uh, how do we enlarge our voice between now and October 1st? This is really crunch time. You know, as James pointed out, the city council has to hold two public hearings uh, before there's a vote. The, the NLC and the OLR want this to happen before October 1st or before the court, the appellate court, you know, here, here's the case. You know, I think as Cecilia pointed out, we don't have to wait for an act down letter. I think everybody, all 3000 members in service uh, members of the PSC need to send that letter. But many of us have individual contacts with our city council people. Uh, we need to get on, in addition to sending a letter, get on the phone with them, um, as maybe Bob Cowan suggested, you know, in delegations of five, 10, 20 people, you know, locally si seeing city council people. So when that city council vote happens, it's a no vote. I mean, we've got a really steep hill to climb. How do we make this more visible? Not only by our activities, but I think as James suggested earlier, a media campaign and placing op-eds. And even if it's tricky for the PSC to endorse public demonstrations outside these two council hearings, uh, and I understand you know, where James is coming from, I assume that organizations like CROC, the Cross uh, Union Retiree Organizing Committee and others will organize demonstrations outside the city council. And I think depending on your mobility and you know, as all of us age, it's really important that we have large numbers there. And as James and others have pointed out, this is no longer just a retiree issue. Uh, it's an in-service member issue we need to mobilize lots and lots and lots uh, of our colleagues, you know, who are still working at CUNY. And if uh, conversations on uh, the DA list are any indication, I think there's gonna be a lot of support there. So that's my exhortation. My question is, how do we become much more visible between now and October 1st? After October 1st too, but the crunch time is right now. Thank you. All right, I'm going to follow up on Bill's question, and, and this will be the last question. Um, uh, you know, visibility, noise, uh, demonstrations, yes. My, my question is, what is our strategy for waking up the rest of our active members to understand that this is a crisis. It is a crisis that has come to a real crisis, which is a very short term, maybe four week crisis. And the DA and the executive council, you know, may have some background and understanding in this. What is the strategy for making that noise to our own members? For example, and I didn't look today, I open the website, the PSC website, and I see, you know, the latest stuff, important stuff. Where is this? This should be a flash, flash message on the website. And I don't know, but is there a strategy for getting the full force of our 25,000 member union to do whatever we're being asked to do, whether it's to send an act now letter or to sign a petition or to visit a council person? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a strategy for that because I don't think that that happens just by wishing it does or one email. And I think we need a quick down and dirty summary of all the 
learning that we gain from listening to all the experts today of what the issues are, um, you know, really synthesized so that we can educate our members on what is really at stake. Yeah. And thanks. And um, I mean, you know, this only just happened on Thursday. Okay. So in terms of updating our website, I mean, with Bill's very fast on updating the website, um, but uh, I, but I hear you. And I think part of it is, so I'm going to follow up with the email that I sent out on Friday, again, by, as you said, continuing to educate. Oh, hey, there it is. Okay. Is that an update on our website, Dean? Yeah, that's the cover of our website. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, there we go. The homepage. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, thank you. All right. So thanks to me. I didn't realize that was happening. Glad, glad it did. Uh, my, you know, my my follow-up uh, communication and it's gonna go to the whole membership, just as the as the email on Friday did. And I think as Bill said earlier, no one has to wait around for an act now letter, but folks who aren't as immersed in these issues as many of you are in this call, um, will find the act now letter educational and also give them uh, com comfort and security in sending something along. But I think that's only a part of what you're asking. And you know, some of what this is about is framing as uh, an issue that never really only uh, was a retiree issue, but now certainly isn't, right? And I think, and it was very helpful when you emailed the full chapter chairs list to say, it, this is not just for this chapter any longer, it's for every chapter. So I think we have to like center the issue of healthcare because frankly, I don't know that all of our members, active members, even understand how we get the healthcare that we're provided, right? That in itself is part of the education that we have a municipal labor committee, that it negotiates on our behalf, that we don't sit across the table from CUNY and negotiate healthcare plans. So, you know, part of what I'm hearing you say is the strategy needs to take a step back and frame in simple terms the issues not only of the moment, what needs to happen over the next four weeks but the bigger picture of how New York City healthcare works for PSC members and retirees. Thank you, James. Um, well, it's 310 and um, I want to uh, very, very much thank James for uh, coming today and giving us a good picture of what else is going on in the PSC. This is not the only issue, it may be to us, the top issue. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Dean and uh, Debbie, Bettina's here. People, who's not here is Barbara Caress and um, Barbara Bowen and, um, uh, who am I forgetting, Donna? Donna, um, because there has been a uh, Medicare plus uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, team, right? That has been working regularly, very, very closely on this uh, and throughout the summer. And um, I want to thank James and the executive council for really, I think, you know, I really feel that the union has taken on this issue as a PSC issue. And among all the really difficult things you have to do every day, James, and then, you know, and every weekend day and, you know, <laughs> I mean, and all the issues that face our in-service people, especially going back to work, uh, it's crucial to take on this issue. And I feel that you have and will continue to do so. 
And uh, for those of you on the call, the Zoom, uh, please check the website regularly. If you haven't gotten, if you don't get a, a message from James shortly or a, um, a blast from me and the officers of the retirees, uh, or if you haven't gotten those last messages, please let the membership department know what your email is. And if you have friends and colleagues who are not members of the chapter, please have them join. Uh, I think this was a great meeting. I thank um, James again and Dean and Debbie for, for making the time. And uh, we will very much be in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, you all. Thank you.